Welcome back to the lab. Protection is important. When a circuit is designed, we make assumptions about how it will be used and the stresses that that circuit will be subjected to. When our assumptions are wrong, things can get out of hand really quickly. Today we're going to walk through a few features that we've added to our UPS or uninterruptible power supply, and those features will help it to survive transient overstresses and a bit of abuse. Let's talk about what we did, how those design features work, and discuss some trade-offs that we made. Our proof-of-concept inverter had an untimely end due to a transient overvoltage condition on the output, and this transient overvoltage condition shorted out the primary side of our transformer. We believe that this overvoltage condition was due to a downstream load and not the inverter itself, and that's mostly because the inverter was simply incapable of creating voltages that were high enough to break through the insulation of that primary winding. After some careful consideration, it became obvious that the primary source of failure was due to a combination of two truths. One is that there were no fuses on the output of the inverter, and intrinsic body diodes don't exist in GAN FETs. Thankfully, these are easy problems to mitigate. We solved these problems with a two-step approach. First, adding clamping diodes across the inverter FETs, which limits the maximum voltage on the output to about one volt above VCC, or one below the reference voltage for that circuit, and this is a standard protection scheme. It's implemented on pretty much every commercially available IC, so it should be good for us too. By clamping the output voltage of the inverter to the rail voltage applied to it, that means that there is now an absolute maximum limit to the voltage that is achievable on that output, even if it's due to voltage applied to the inverter instead of voltage sourced by it. By having a defined maximum voltage, at least until one of our diodes blows up, Having that defined maximum limit in a fault condition is important because it allows us to perform the circuit design required to prevent damage due to the fault. These clamping diodes should have things covered for nearly all transient overvoltage conditions, but before we move on from this part of the circuit, I think we should deal with the unhandled short circuit fault, because this fault exposed a gap in our architecture. And that leads us to the second part of our solution, which is fuses. If our software isn't fast enough to respond to an overcurrent fault, adding a fast blow fuse could save something. Depending on where the fault lies, we could be saving the inverter, the load, or some combination of the two, and these fuses will prevent excessive quantities of current from flowing into or out of the inverter stage. While we're talking about current, our plan is to incorporate a GFCI type functionality as well, looking for current mismatch between the line 1 and line 2 outputs of the inverter. If 4 amps are flowing out and only 3 amps are flowing in, we're missing an amp and should probably shut down. That missing current found a path and it wasn't through the inverter, so we can't be sure that it's not going through a person. Better just to let go and uh, not electrocute anybody. Our inverter output is starting to look and sound better, but we still aren't done. Metal oxide varistors, or MOVs, are well known for catching on fire. What? I, I mean, MOVs are known for catching on fire, but they're also known for being a resistor that changes its resistance based on the voltage across it. And this is an awesome action, because it, as you can see in this graph, the current that will pass through a MOV increases greatly as the voltage across it also increases. This function helps to balance out transient over voltages on mains, and that's why MOVs are typically the protective components inside of surge protectors. They're also commonly seen on the input of most AC to DC power supplies. This leads us back to that whole catching on fire business. Mobs are designed to gulp power in short bursts. It's great for battling transient overvoltages, but isn't so great for extended faults. If a fault condition occurs periodically or constantly instead of once a day, the mob may become thermally overloaded, causing it to fail catastrophically. This is one of those instances where the phrase you can't make an omelet without cracking some eggs comes to mind. Speaking of, I'm hungry. Thanks for watching. We would rather have our mob hold on through its dying breath, protecting the upstream circuitry as much as physically possible before turning itself into a puddle of molten slag. Designing the mob to save itself thermally would make it a less effective protective function, which would defeat the whole purpose of its existence in most circuits. Well, that's why we need to consider the impact of this device failing catastrophically. It really could happen, in fact it's designed to happen, if there's a continuous overload. Sometimes protective functions are just this way, 
where they sacrifice themselves to save the larger system. That said, if the mob fails before the transient overvoltage is complete, the circuit will still be destroyed, and that's why it's important to size the metal oxide barrister correctly to handle the quantity of peak and RMS power applied to it. A reverse polarity protection implementation is another important addition to this UPS, since the batteries can be installed by the end user. I hope that I never really need to see the circuit work, but if I do, it'll be awesome. The only place where a reverse voltage can be applied to the system are those two DC power inputs. They're just a couple screw terminals with reasonably small silkscreen labels, really not a whole lot going on. There's nothing mechanically preventing me in a delirious stupor from connecting the battery terminals to this system backwards. I'm not a rocket surgeon, but I'm pretty sure that connecting negative 24 volts to our board when there's the capability to source hundreds of short circuit amps from our lead acid batteries, that would probably result in a firework show of components flying off the board. Our desire to protect the system against reverse voltage in combination with the large current that needs to flow through the system in the normal operating condition, that's an interesting challenge. How can we protect our circuit from reverse voltage conditions while maintaining high efficiency under load? During normal operations, somewhere between 30 to 55 amps will be flowing through the protective function, and if we want to protect our circuit against reverse voltage using a MOSFET, we need to consider its on-state resistance, which would probably be around 100 milliohms. That ends up dissipating about 5.5 watts with the power flowing through it. Now, that's a lot of heat, and not to mention about 1% of our output power. That kind of loss, the always present, not really doing anything for us, just sipping energy all the time sort of thing, that's exactly the kind of feature that we'd typically like to avoid. However, in a fault condition, we can't just leave our circuit unprotected. I, these boards are pretty expensive. They need to be protected against this. How can we resolve these conflicting design goals? Introducing one of the simplest and my personal favorite reverse polarity protection method, a diode. Well, a fuse diode. I grabbed a couple beefy diodes, each rated for a peak current of 100 amps, and put two of them in parallel. I believe we can reasonably expect these two to survive a transient overcurrent condition on the order of 100 to 170 amps together. This current, in combination with the two parallel 30 amp fuses, should blow with plenty of margin in just a few milliseconds. Uh, to summarize, by shunting all of the reverse energy through our fuses, we take the fireworks show that would be the whole board exploding, and then condense that destruction into an easily replaceable fuse. Even better, these fuses have a resistance of about, of about 2 milliohms, and the diodes barely leak any current. This means it will be dissipating about 55 milliwatts across the two parallel fuses. That's a pretty sweet compromise if you ask me. We achieve the efficiency we crave, but also provide reverse polarity protection for the system. Great! Now let's move on to our next challenge. As we move through the design, there are many other smaller fuses protecting the controls and various switch mode power supplies. The reason why we added additional fusing here is for two reasons. We aren't designing these modules ourselves unless we find out that we need to, and since the accuracy and ripple requirements on our DC supplies are pretty relaxed, I don't expect we'll need to. The second reason is that if one of these supplies fails catastrophically, they'll never be capable of blowing the two parallel 30 amp fuses. Therefore, we need to select some more fuses that are appropriate and smaller that protect these circuits. We chose a footprint that allows for use of an off-the-shelf module, but also enough board space to roll our own switch mode power supply if we need better performance. At least better performance than these can provide. If there's a design flaw in one of these modules, the fuses exist to prevent damage to our digital circuitry. As a final protective measure, we've implemented temperature monitoring throughout the design. When things start to heat up, that's usually a good indication that something's going wrong. Uh, heat just kind of appears near faults most of the time. If the output is overloaded, some other parts are going to get hot due to the overstress. The first components we expect to break a sweat will be the various MOSFETs used through the, throughout the design to control the flow of power through the boost converter, hot swap controller, and inverter output. By monitoring these critical regions of the board, at least the temperature there, we can verify objectively that the cooling solution is performing its job adequately and the silicon switches are within their safe operating area. We should leverage the fact that our heat sinks are thermally connected to the ground plane of our PCB to maximize the accuracy of our temperature measurements near these components. We can assume that the case temperature of our FETs will be approximately equal to the heat sink temperature. Now that's, those are most of the protective functions that we needed to add in and modifications that we needed to make to the inverter to prevent it from being damaged in the future. All things considered, these were some pretty minor changes. 
This means that our proof of concept inverter was actually pretty good. The majority of the work when changing the proof of concept inverter to become a full uninterruptible power supply or UPS was adding those components that allow for the new functionality and not fixing design flaws. Here's what we needed to add. A battery charging circuit with cell balancing for our lead acid batteries, automatic crossover circuit to switch between the two DC inputs for the system, a wide range voltage regulator that can boost our battery voltage up to 250 volts, provisions for inverter soft start, inrush current limiting on the DC inputs to prevent arcing when connecting the batteries to the system, and establishing an isolation barrier between the inverter output and the user. Through the hot swap controller, push-pull converter, custom transformer, and our battery charging circuit, all of our design goals were met. The most interesting circuit of these, at least to me, is the battery charger. It's the most interesting to me because it's also one of the most custom. I decided to roll my own control loop for this, which operates on the application microcontroller. This is because doing so allows me to implement a four-phase charging cycle, and this charging cycle brings lead-acid batteries up to 3.6 volts per battery, which is a pretty healthy voltage for active standby use. The three standard charging phases are con constant current mode, constant voltage mode, and then high impedance mode, we, where we just kind of let the batteries float. We added a constant power mode at the beginning, which allows for faster charging than otherwise possible. Our battery charger is limited in output power, or in input power, to 30 watts, due to the off-the-shelf DC-to-DC converter we used. Therefore, the charging current would be limited to 1.11 amps, and instead of that, we just follow the 30 watt limit to put out the maximum current possible up to 2 amps. However, once we reach our voltage set point, the control system will begin to regulate voltage and then flow charge up to the final voltage until the current cutoff is reached. At this point, the charging and cell ba balancing circuitry is disconnected and the batteries are left floating. This floating state is maintained until the batteries self-discharge below our hysteresis voltage or the backup is used to ride through a power outage. Rinse and repeat. Bring them up through that cycle and then we'll be ready to go again. Since our battery capacity is not defined, I plan on creating an algorithm that approximates the battery capacity based on how quickly the battery voltage increases while charging at a constant power. This information can then be used to calculate estimated runtime remaining during discharge cycles. Over time, the model of the connected batteries will improve, providing ever increasing accuracy of the battery runtime. By allowing the inverter to know what the nominal battery capacity of these batteries are, and being able to measure the actual capacity as we're charging and discharging, a periodic self-test will allow us to detect when the batteries are beginning to show their age and behave less ideally. This periodic self-test that would consist of running off the batteries for about 10 minutes every month would also be a mechanism for the UPS to track the battery aging effects over time at the cost of causing the batteries to wear slightly faster. I'm really excited for all of the features we plan to add to our inverter, and I hope that you are too. We have the framework set up to build a great UPS, capable of switching between power sources, running periodic self-tests, communicating with the outside world, predicting battery failure based on charge and discharge performance, features that I hope exist in every UPS on the market, it makes me really sad that they don't. We have a clear path forward and a schematic captured with our design updates for Project Darwin. This means that we're ready to move on to the layout. We've officially ended the proof of concept phase and we're on to the full development effort. Subscribe to be notified of our future videos where we will upgrade our 3D printer so we can 3D print our own transformer bobbins and prepare our design for automated PCB assembly. I think that power supplies are great and inverters are better. If you think so too, let me know by hitting the like button on this video or leaving a comment letting us know what you enjoyed. Most of all, I hope that you learned something great today and I hope to see you again soon. Thanks for watching EE for everyone and thank you for staying till the end. Bye!